when we come together in the corporate worship, it's a good time. Listen, nobody's zeroing you out saying, well, you didn't sound good enough on that one. God's like, just go ahead. Say those praises out. Hey, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, the Bible says that praise steals the avenger. The devil hears it when you say those words. Yeah, he does. It shuts him up. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you gonna keep playing? Are you gonna keep singing? I don't know. I'm just kind of waiting on the Lord to tell me to move. Okay. All right. I well, got so, I got so out I got so I got so into the throne room I about passed out up here. I didn't know. <laughs> I had a hard time. I was wallowing. I was staggering around. I was too. I was staggering around up in the throne room. I said, "God, we got to get it together. What's going on here?" You know. God's faithful. Well, it's really an honor to be here. Um, we're just so thankful for you guys. It's great to have family and know that you guys are seeking God with all of your heart. And know that you guys are faithful with your prayers and with your what you're doing and how just pulling up here. This building just screams as a testimony of Jesus Christ. I mean, seriously, it's seed time and harvest and God's faithfulness to bring it forth and manifestation and um, just to see you guys as, as a family and for you guys to welcome us up here, it means a great deal to us. We thank you. You know, sometimes when you're when God leads you into a certain way or a certain place, you feel like you're the only one that's doing it. But God will always, listen, even when Elijah was up there, he thought he was the only one that was faithful and in Israel, God said, I got 7,000 of them. <laughs> what? I thought I was the only one. You're not the only one. It's good, though, when God opens your eyes and your understanding to where there's more people that are standing strong in faith, strong in the word, believe in God to manifest his promises. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, um, Yes, while she's waiting on the Lord and I'm waiting on her. <laughs> Look, you intimidated me by the 17,000 scriptures you sent last night. Look, I said, I said, honey, I said, send me a couple of scriptures that you're going to bounce off of and let me meditate on them. He goes to the bathroom for like the longest time ever. It was seven minutes. <laughs> and I hear this ding, 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 ding. And I open my text message, and there's literally 14 scriptures, and all of them have like 14 chapters with 16 scriptures to each one. And then at the bottom it says, oh, this is something to just get us started. God gave me 40 verses, save one. He comes out of the bathroom. I am totally overwhelmed. I'm like, you're just going to have to preach it, and I'm just going to have to go with it, whatever it is. <laughs> so I tried to look at all of them. I think I missed a couple, but <sighs> I had a Bible study last night, folks. <laughs> I love it because God's so faithful. Anytime that you seek him, he says, seek and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Ask, and it shall be given. I just, I know that those are some of the verses that we learned in Sunday school, and Sometimes when we get a little bit older, we kind of depart from some of the things that we learned in Sunday school. I just want to encourage you. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, when we were in Sunday school, one of my favorite songs, remember that one song that we all knew and sang? Go on for a second, because I can't do that. Sing it. You know it. Father Abraham had many sons. Which <laughs> <Yeah>. one? <laughs> yeah, that one. No, you know where one of us will go. Let's see how to go. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know that song. Well, the, the only thing, uh, what I wanted to show you is that when we were kids and we did it, when we came over here and said, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Everybody stood up. And then you'd sit back down. And then this group would stand up. And you go, praise ye the Lord. Then you'd sit back down. I, sometimes 
we mature so much that we grow out of some of the things that are so effective to us that God has sent in the right direction. And sometimes when you stay seated, it gets easier for you to stay seated and not go in the direction that the Spirit of God needs you to go in. And sometimes we mature so much and we get so wise that maybe we know better or we feel like we know better than what it is that God has for us. I just want to encourage you, it's okay to stay young. It's okay to stay young in your faith. It's okay to stay young in the revelation. It's okay to stay young in your praise and worship. I know, listen, I used to say at our church, well, we'll get, we'll get to that. We won't, we'll go for that. They got nothing to do with what we're doing. I'm still waiting on living. <laughs> what time do we have to be out of here? By checkout time. <laughs> Amen. I'm so thankful for my wife. And I, I'm so thankful for Joy and Christina and, and Janessa. Thank you guys for your faithfulness and, and just all that you've done. Getting us ready. You don't even know what they went through to get us ready to get here. Not to mention what's what they've had to take up on their shoulders since we've been here. So I, I just am so thankful for your all's faithfulness and service unto the Lord. Amen. Uh oh. I lost my shoes. I saw them. I tripped over them once. Sorry. Right. Amen. Oh, thank you. And your shoes have come back. Yes. And I have my iPad with my 15 scriptures. And I'm really not going to use any of those. <laughs> God gives me 30 or 40 scriptures and I'm thinking I've got this big long sermon made out and then all of a sudden I get there and I can't even remember what any of them are. And okay, well, I'm going to ask that you pray. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Father, we just come before you now in the name of Jesus and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your will being done on this earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Father God, that you know the right things to say, to do, to manifest your anointing and your power right here, yes. right now. And we give you praise, honor, and glory for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I, start, <laughs> I say we start here. Let's go. <laughs> uh, go to First Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll start there. Was that even one of the scriptures? It was. Okay. <laughs> I saw that one. <laughs> I did. I looked at that one. Does the word come to us or do we have to? <laughs> She's waiting on a, we got chapter one. Oh, I thought she knew. No. First Thessalonians chapter what? Five? It might be second Thessalonians. Let's, let's, let's just see what happens. Give me a second, Ashley. Don't get in no big hurry. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for real, guys. Hey, listen. Um, I'm so thankful for us to be here, but check this out. I'm not Pastor Jim. And I'm not Pastor Jack. I'm not Pastor Bob. <laughs> we'll just have you guys pray for me and just let's trust the Spirit of God to do what he does, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quench not the spirit. Come on, Ashley. I'm tr I'm sorry. I'm trying. Are you kidding me? Can I get somebody else back here? Christina, help her. Man. I mean, I'm trying here. Good job, Ashley. <laughs> she follows instructions well. It's like, wow. Verse 19, verse 19. Wow. I don't even know what to say. I, that's your scriptures. That's what you said. <laughs> well, now I'm feeling all intimidated and stuff. <laughs> all right, um, let's go to chapter. That's just got me off my move. That to get rid of that. <laughs> Please, there now I feel better. <laughs> For real, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-three. Or we can start in verse 19. Watch this. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> Isn't God funny? <laughs> All right. Well, let's just start with that. Quench not the spirit. 
My version says never restrain or put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that word for quench means to extinguish. Yes. Like if you were going to extinguish a fire, quench not the spirit. Okay, let's go on and see what comes up now. I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> No, I need a button, a shock button to go to the next verse. Verse 20. Despise not prophesying. <laughs> yes, that's good too. And don't be one who scorns prophecies. Okay, all right. Okay. Go to the next one. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Okay. Yeah. Be faithful. Examine them by putting them to the test. And afterward, hold tightly to what is proven to be right. Oh, this is a good one. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Avoid Actually, it. You're doing a great job. Avoid it. Yes. Avoid evil. Verse 23, it says, In the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Better look at the next verse. Mine basically says the same thing. <laughs> we'll read it. Oh. Now may the God of peace and harmony set you apart, making you completely holy, and may your entire being, spirit, soul, and body be kept completely flawless in the appearing of our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Okay, maybe so it was a little different, but mine was better. <laughs> Hey, we could just read the word. It's good. Yeah, right. I mean, come on. What was the next one? This is one of my favorite verses in, in the whole scriptures. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Yes. You know, in, uh, in February of 2006, uh, Libby and I were driving a car and we got hit by a train. And we were, it was the last night of the word rally. And we had been, you know, back in those days, we had gotten set free from drugs and alcohol and we got turned on to the things of God. And I was a drug addict seven days a week. Okay, I didn't, Libby, she smoked some every day, but I mean, I'm talking about, I wanted, I wanted cocaine, I wanted meth, I wanted crack, I wanted ecstasy, I wanted acid, I wanted, and I had to have some kind of drugs seven days a week. If you don't understand that, I'm just saying that's where I was. I still worked, bathed, and did all that, but I was a drug addict. You were I a functioning getting, addict, yeah. Huh? You were a functioning addict. Yeah, I mean, I liked, I just liked getting high, and I didn't care what it was. From the time when I was five years old, I started sniffing gas. And I didn't know that it was wrong. I didn't know that I was getting high. I would just sniff it until I'd pass out. It'd make my head hurt real bad, so I wouldn't do it again for a while. But then when I'd smell it, I'd do it again. I did that my whole life. I didn't know that it was ever wrong until I was about 18 years old and I did it in some guy's yard and I passed out and he said, Scotty, if you keep doing that, you're going to die. And I thought, what do you mean die? It's just gas. I didn't know. I grew up that way. When I got set free from drugs and alcohol, something that I had done seven days a week, I didn't just get high every now and then. It was a, my life from the time I got up till the time I went to bed, it's what I did. So when we got turned on to the things of God and, and we flushed our drugs down the commode, I had to have something. I hadn't lived not high my whole life. And God got us into the things of God. And it was the seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And I'm talking about we were, we were helping out in, in three different churches and I mean, on Sundays, it was three different churches on Sundays. It was something on Monday. It was something on Tuesday. It was something on Wednesday, Thursday, two or three things on Friday. And I mean, you know, I hear people say about, oh, you got me doing something almost every night. Most people say that it's about three nights a week. <laughs> I want to smack them right. <laughs> and I was getting up and being at prayer at 6 a.m. Yeah, and not to mention, I mean, every day we went to intercessory prayer at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I mean, that's... That was a prerequisite for anything else we were doing. And we were just doing so much, but, but we kind of needed to be involved in the ministry so that we didn't get back into a different direction, okay? Well, in the midst of, of doing all that, and I'm talking about we were, we were faithful. We were faithful with as much money as we had. 
we would sow into seven and then eight. You know, we were sowing into completed works, looking for new things. We were given cars and money and our time and our service and anything that we could, we were sowing because God set us free. We just were glad to be able to have something still to give. And in the midst of all that, on the last day, on the Friday night of the Word Rally, and this was in 2006, and uh, Pastor Callahan was fixing to preach, and we had to drop our daughter off in Berea. And when we had dropped our daughter off in Berea, then we were going to go back to, it wasn't the Word Rally, it was the Advance, because yeah. it was in February. So we, we were dropping uh, Kara off, and then we were going to go back to the church. And when we did... I thought I was turning into a parking lot, and instead I pulled upon the train tracks, and a train going 40 miles an hour just hit us, and it literally hit Libby. I mean, her seat was about nine inches wide where it hit her, and yeah, I mean, it, it literally, it hit her, it knocked her larynx loose, it broke her shoulder, it broke her hips in four places, and when I looked over at her, her blood was just running out of her mouth and she was she was dead dead as a doorknob i don't know how dead a doorknob is I've heard that said. pretty I'm dead not, i'm not sure about i'm not sure about all that <laughs> but but at that moment of time i mean it was rather traumatic and and but at the same time when at that moment when it happened the first thing that came out of me was i looked over at libby and i mean it, it kind of scared me but I just looked at her and what came out of me was that you will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And that was 2006. We quit doing drugs in 2002. So it was only three and a half years in to what we were doing. We weren't, uh, you know, we, we were doing the best we could do. But, um, and that came up out of me when, when she started breathing again. The first thing that came out of her was Jesus. Suddenly life came back into her. <laughs> I mean, just like, just like that, and she started speaking out Jesus, and what was so phenomenal about it, regardless of how bad, I mean, there were people looking in the car at this point, and, you know, people were trying to freak out, but what was so phenomenal about it is that when it happened, the Word of God came up out of me, and even more significant is that the Word of God caused life to come back into her, and then Jesus is what was coming out of her. So see, our lives were changed from that point on because in the face of death, I mean facing death, we didn't just theoretically believe that, oh, maybe we'll answer the word. In the face of death, I know that I know that I know that I know the word of God's what's going to come out of me. In my, if my wife in the face of death, I know that I know that I know that the word of God comes out of her. It's not just something theoretical that we talk about. Well, yeah, if I had to face that, that's what I would do. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when that happened, that's what came up out of us. So from that moment forward, we had that conviction. You know, there's one thing about informative knowledge, and then there's another thing about experiential knowledge. And it's necessary to have informative knowledge, but... God also wants us to have the confidence and the conviction of the experiential knowledge. And that's why it's so important not to just stay sitting down just because you get a little bit older. Because you quit experiencing the knowledge you've been gaining. How's the Bible say it? What's knowledge do? Knowledge puffs up. That's why so many of us old people get so much bigger. <laughs> That's why, that, that's why I go on Pastor Jesus Bob's knowledge. That's a real knowledgeable individual. <laughs> you see, if you, stick, if you stick with Jesus knowledge, you won't puff up as bad. <laughs> um, I really like that scripture too. The one who calls you by name is trustworthy and will thoroughly complete his work in you. I'm just going to kind of pick up where Scott left off because that's not really the end of the story, the end of the testimony. Some of you have heard it. Maybe some of you haven't, so I'm going to kind of skip through a whole lot of it. But one thing that was very significant to me is, and we were talking about this at dinner, is people often ask you what happens, what, what kind of experience, what did you see or feel experience when you, when you passed away, when you were dead? It's like nothing. It was so peaceful. There was so much peace. I didn't ascend to the heavens and see Jesus. Oh, 
I didn't see any of that. You know, and I didn't I didn't touch the flames of hell either. I was so thankful that I did not get to see that. I didn't smell any smoke. I didn't know. I was just like, oh, okay. I could just I just felt like I was. It was so peaceful. It was so much peace. And I could see them cutting me out of the car. So I knew that I had left my body. Because I could see certain things. Even after I came back, it was the strangest thing. I could see them doing what they were doing. So even though I was, it's like Paul said, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't even know. But I knew everything that they were doing to me. Because I could see it. Then when they got me out of the car, they put me in the ambulance. And this is where this word is so is so real, because when we when we got into the ambulance, um, the ambulance driver was like, "You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm gonna be okay." And he said, "No, really, you're gonna be okay." And I said, "Well, of course, you can't kill divine destiny." That's right. And I remember saying that, and it wasn't me saying it. It was something that came out of my spirit because it hit me so deeply. You can't kill divine destiny. Right. So whatever the enemy meant for evil to take us out, to destroy, to kill, steal the call that was placed on our lives, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. We, we were terrible, terrible, bad, heathen people. We were actually good at being heathens. We were really good at being heathens. We were pretty good at being heathens. We were good at being heathens together. That's right. We were. But there was no peace. There was no peace. We, we made money. We made good money. We had cars. We had houses. New house. We, had, we built a house. I mean, Still, the big Jeep Grand, Grand Cherokee. We did. This we was back had, in the 90s. Yeah, this is back in the 90s. And we were, to, for somebody on the outside looking in, you would have never thought there, were any, there was anything wrong with us. we were young and skinny and really good looking. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about both of us. We were. Wrong. What are you saying? We're not. We're knowledgeable. We're more knowledgeable now. What are you saying? <laughs> we're young and dumb. <laughs> no, try again. Thank you. She is, but I'm not. Thank okay. you. Thank you. That's what I was meaning to say. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> you made me lose my train of thought. I don't even know where I was going. You can't kill divine destiny. You can't kill divine destiny. We had a bunch of stuff, and looking at us from the outside, it looked like we really had. We really had it going on. Yeah, it looked like we had peace. It looked like we had it all together, but we did not. There was no peace. We were fighting. As soon as that door was shut, we were fighting. We were cussing each other. We were slipping off to the bathroom. I wouldn't cuss at her when we correct her. I've never cussed her. I quit cussing in 1994 before I married her. This is true, but you never thought about a cuss word? Okay. Well, anyway, I was cussing him, okay, and beating him up. I was doing it. She was cussing me bad. <laughs> really badly. Get your ball. I need my ball, yes. Um, she thought that if she cussed me enough, she could make me cuss. God did. God took away my cussing. I didn't try to quit. God spoke to my heart. In, it was actually in 1995, and God says, I'm a God that does things from the inside out. And when he said that to me, I quit cussing. I was still a dope smoking, adultering, gambling heathen, but I quit cussing. And Libby tried so hard to make me cuss. She just knew that she could make me so mad that I'd cuss, but God took the cussings out of me. So. Yeah. So I don't. I mean, I don't know who needs to. My cussings. <laughs> that might be a word for somebody. Who, who is it that needs the cussings out of them this morning? <laughs> You know them kissing cousins? The ones that interlink together and then you cuss your cuss words? Yeah. I was cussing my cuss words. Uh, so that's what was going on with us. But, you know, we, had a, we knew how to really put on the facade and really just make it look really good from the outside in. But from the inside out, we were tormented. We were, we were not happy. Um, it, it was bad. It was really bad. And we were on the verge of divorce, really. I mean... And some little Mexican chick was chasing him. And she wasn't chasing me. I had her. <laughs> okay. I hired her. <laughs> I didn't know any of this at the time. Just something in my spirit was like, if I don't find a way to get this thing under control on the inside of me, 
it's, it's going to destroy us from the inside out. We, we knew that. that. We'd been to church a little bit. We just gotten a taste of it. You know what I'm saying? But we hadn't fully given over and given into it. So he was at work one night. I don't know how we jumped on this. But he was at work one night, and I was just at my end. I was like, I've got to do something different. And I went on to church by myself. I just went to church, and I sat in the second row, and I'll never forget it. I went in, and I said, God, you know, you're going to have to speak to me. I didn't know how to hear God. I, I had never been raised in church before, so my family was military. So it was a lot of cussing, drinking, you know, I mean, hardcore, just a hardcore life. We moved around a lot. We didn't get attached to anything or anybody. So I didn't really even know how to have a relationship. I didn't know how to hear God or anything. But I was sitting on the second row, and God spoke to me because I was so broken. I was so desperate to hear something from him. And just like this word says, the one who calls you by name is trustworthy and will thoroughly complete his work in you. So he started something. A couple of years back, but I just couldn't grasp it. I couldn't see a way to get a hold of it. But he knew my name. Yeah. And he said, a smoking flax I will not quench, and a bruised reed I will not break. And when those scriptures were read from the pulpit, it was like God was speaking directly to me. He knew my fire was smoldering. It was in there, but it wasn't burning for him. He knew that I was... I was, I was willing to bend, but I was fixing to break. And he knew that he had to rush into my soul, into my life, and save me from what I was getting ready to destroy all around me. Scott comes home that night from work, and I'm so excited because God spoke to me. He spoke to my heart. And I'm so excited, but the, the, the marriage problems didn't even matter. Didn't even matter. I was so excited about God speaking to me that when he came out, I was like, oh, my gosh, you're not going to believe this. God spoke to me. I heard him. I know it was him. And he was like, okay. And at that moment, it shifted. Everything shifted. And what did it do for you? Well, actually, I came home that night, and I was pretty drunk and high, but I had been to a Lexington Legends game in our press box up there, and I had come home to tell her I wanted to divorce. I was done. I was ready to move to the next level with my little, uh, my, you know, my other plans. <laughs> I mean, I literally, I mean, uh, that's no, no joke whatsoever. I, 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 was, uh, I was running a McDonald's at the time in, in Lexington, Kentucky, and we had, a, we had the, a press box up at the, the Lexington Legends Stadium, and we'd been up there partying, and I made up my mind. I wouldn't do it. But I, I told I told Veronica I said I said I'm going to go home and let my wife know that I'm I'm done you know because I wasn't mad it just this wasn't working out it wasn't right it just I wasn't good we for weren't her. I wasn't good for her she wasn't good for me so I literally went home that night and you might not remember this but actually Sissy Phillips was at the house with you yeah and they were they were praying in tongues I mean blah, 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 blah. and I'm talking about I go in I'm drunk. I'm, thinking, I'm sitting here thinking all over the house and said, I'm going to go in there and tell her I'm, I'm not even going to talk. I'm done. It's over. I'm going to divorce. You know, we're going to figure out how to do this thing. I, I'm just going to say that and then go to bed. I go in there and they're like dancing around and praying in tongues and speaking the word. Oh, we want to pray for you too. Trying to make me pray in tongues. I'm sitting here drunk. I'm sitting here thinking. Needless to say, I never even had the chance to tell her I wanted a divorce. Because see, God knew better. God knew better, and he knew at that moment of time, no matter where I was, he had a better way. And that's why I'm so thankful for my wife, because even in the midst of me getting ready to make the biggest mistake of my life and go in a complete different direction than what God had, God already had a plan in place to see to it, that even though I felt like everything within me, I thought everything within me, I was done, I wanted a divorce, I was going in a different direction. Regardless of my thoughts, regardless of my feelings, God had a way to interrupt me right in the midst of everything I was thinking and everything that I was feeling and see to it that his will is done on this earth as it is in heaven. That was a, that was a big deal in our lives. God knew I had your tacos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Girl. I want to... 
Oh, gosh. <laughs> now I'm getting nervous. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, and, and so from that point on, something shifted in our marriage and it shifted in our lives because he got on board with me. And we got on board together. Together. With God. With Neither God, one of yes. us were good at it, though. No, we weren't. We fumbled around a lot the first few years, and it was okay because God was training us up. He was showing us how to be married. Well, I'll tell you how significant that night was because she had a career at the Court of Appeals, and I had a career at McDonald's. And that next day, she put her notice in to resign from the Court of Appeals, and I put my notice in to resign from McDonald's. Yeah, and we, we sold out, went completely 100% into the ministry, and we learned to live by faith, not by what we knew we could do in the natural. And there was a word, I don't know if it's, it's somewhere else, but reminded me of that, that you sent me out of the 14 chapters that I read. There's a word on that. There is. He started in the natural and ended up. Oh, yeah. First Corinthians. Yeah, that one. <laughs> so once we did that, things shifted in our marriage. Did the peace come automatically? No, it did not. It took a little while. We had to learn how to work it. It was a process. And it was okay because we decided, you know what? If it's not fun, God's not in it. So we're just going to make it fun as much as we can. Did the challenges come? Did the trials come? Did the tribulations come? Heck yeah, they did. We had to get on our face and, and believe for the electric bill sometimes. We had to get on our face and believe for a car. Because we, when we sold out, it was the most miraculous thing. God was in it. The bank calls us and says, hey, we'd love to buy your house. That's when all the housing stuff was going on. And the banks were trying to buy up all these houses and stuff. And I, was like, I didn't know this at the time, but I was like, heck yeah, you can buy because we want we out of debt. So the bank actually bought us, bought our house and gave us money. That was just... And then somebody asked if they could buy our Jeep. God is sending people to buy yeah, us. Somebody just stops by and says, I was really wondering if I could buy that Jeep from you. And uh, we thought, man, I'd get us out from under that thing. And, and then that woman said, oh, and by the way, I've got this car and I don't know yeah. what to do with it. So I want to buy your Jeep, but I want you to just take this car. It was a. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were young at the things of God. Now, but now, listen. I was used to driving a stealth. Okay, I don't know if you know what that is. It's very sweet. It's like a Mitsubishi three thousand or three hundred, whatever they are. Those little. Okay, so I'm used to driving sports cars. This lady. <laughs> it was no granny. I mean, no. It was a. It was. It was. It was <laughs> no granny car. It was a. It was a four door Oldsmobile Calais. <laughs> Maroon. <laughs> the velour interior. Velour interior. I get in this car and I'm like, okay, God, way to humble a girl. <laughs> but it taught me. I, I had to really learn that material things were not important. Hey, that car got us intercessory prayer. Except one morning it didn't because we ran out of gas. Pastor Jack had to come get us. It, yes, he did. <laughs> We've had some adventures. But God has been good to us. He taught us a lot in those first few years. He taught us that things were not important, that he was important. And he did humble us those next few years and taught us how to rely on him and not what we could do in our own strength, how to be grateful for where we are and for where we were going and not look to the future so much as stay in your now. Be present in your now. Be present with him in your now. Learn how to get into his presence. And we can talk about all these things now and we can laugh about them. Because back then, we didn't laugh a whole, whole lot in the first year or two. I did. You did, which would make me mad. But, but we did have to learn how to laugh our way through the bad times. We did have to learn how to lock in and pray together when things got crazy out of control. We did, have, we did have to learn how to humble ourselves. And, and it, was a, it was a great lesson. It was, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how grateful I am to God for saving me from where I was. Sure. The life that I had gotten myself into, the things I had done as a, as a young woman, and even as a married woman, some of the, the things that I said to my husband and did to him when we first got married, I mean, they could really break somebody down and make them be very shameful. But God rushed in and he said, there's no condemnation in me. I have forgiven you. 
So rise up, daughter of God. Rise up, my child. And go on and do this thing. Do this thing with joy. Let me be your strength. And when God was able to minister to my heart, when I actually got to hear his voice for the first time in my entire life, when he called my name, I tell you what, it's an experience you'll never forget. I, I, I went down on my knees, and every hair on my body stood up. And I was like, okay. And the only thing he said to me was, I hear you, Elizabeth. That's all he said to me, but that's all he had to say. That's all he had to say is, I hear you. So at that point, I knew whatever prayers I had, whatever petitions I had for the Lord, he was hearing me. He was hearing me. And he'll hear you. Am I supposed to put your little things? Is that it? I'm, I'm feeling all nostalgic for Jesus right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. Well, that's good because I want to. I want to take a few minutes and kind of mess with you a little bit. Um, did I say that out loud? I, I don't have any big new revelation that I want to give you and try to uh, be profound or anything like that. It's just not me. But I pray to God that maybe God can say something through us and through our testimony that will, will help you see something in a way that maybe you've not been able to see. Maybe help you hear something in a way you've not been able to hear. Maybe even perceive something in a way that you've not been able to perceive. I, I pray that God can help you have a paradigm shift on some truths that maybe you're already established in. You know, because it's not always something new that we need. Sometimes you just need to be able to see it in a different way. Right. Sometimes we get stuck because we can't see beyond what's in front of us but um, you know sometimes if you just get a different perspective it gives you it gives you a fresh something in here so that you can go ahead and take the next step so I, I found out that in my my walk with God I mean I thank God for the, the the moment that I got set free from drugs and alcohol man when I flushed that down the toilet and we cursed the desire and it went down the toilet it was phenomenal at that moment of time but it, you're not promised that it's going to happen that way and, and there's been other things in my life that have not happened that way. It, it took me 20-some years to quit smoking cigarettes. I mean, all the drugs that were physically addictive, I flushed them down, the desire was gone. But, buddy, I was praying in tongues out of one side of my mouth and toking cigarettes out of the other side of my mouth. I remember when I first started fasting, when I would, fa listen, I smoked cigarettes anyway, but when I would fast, I'm talking about I smoked cigarettes even faster. I'm talking about, and I, I remember one time I, I was working at McDonald's and I, I was like on a seven day fast. I'd never fasted before or anything. And I'd run in there and I'd run into the bathroom. And I'd, I mean, I'd be, I, I was hungry, but instead of eating any food, I'd just hot box a cigarette. And, and finally there towards the end of it, I felt like God spoke to me and said, stop fasting until you quit smoking. Start by fasting cigarettes. I thought, oh, I'm fasting food. Shh, shh. You, know, <laughs> you get what I'm saying? It took a long time for me to do that. And, you know, it doesn't, God doesn't always do things the exact same way. Thank you for my pen. I'm going to keep score with that this afternoon. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm rather excited. Um, uh, so, and, I, and I'm thankful for when we got hit by the train. I'm thankful that God miraculously showed up. And, and brought my wife back to life. I'm thankful that we didn't just die and, and be snuffed out at that moment of time. Um, but, you know, the, the, the life that we live is not just this big moment to big moment. There's a lot of these moments. <laughs> There's a lot of these moments in between. And a lot of times in the moments in between, the big miraculous manifestations are where sometimes we get distracted, get off track, um, get a little complacent, uh, a little, uh, what's it called, uh, maybe a little atrophy, maybe our faith suffers a little atrophy, because it's actually in these mundane moments in life where the adversary uses that against us, because it's not, there's not something real big keeping our attention, unless you have that personal relationship with God through the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, God has provided a way 
to fulfill the mundane moments of our life so that you don't get bored and have this itch and have to go in a different direction. You don't just have to chase one big faith high after another faith high and live faith high from faith high. Instead, he has a way through the manifestation of his love and the revelation of Jesus Christ to keep you burning moment by moment. And that way, when that fire needs to spread, that fire is burning already. When Jesus was on the road to Emmaus with the disciples, remember he had been crucified. And these guys had given their whole life over to Jesus and walked with him. And then all of a sudden they saw him get crucified. They saw him die. They saw him take his last breath. They, they know that they put that spear into his side and there wasn't a bit of movement there. They knew he was dead. And they got on the road to Emmaus Shouldn't even have been going there. Completely out of the way of anything that they should have been doing. And, and they were downtrodden. They were heavy hearted. And while they were walking, feeling sorry for each other and feeling bad because everything they had put their whole life into just got snuffed out. I put my whole life into that church. I just knew. I just knew that he was going to be the savior of the world and now he's gone. Everything I'd hoped in, that I'd trusted in, I left all my family, I left my job, I left this, I left that to be a part of Jesus, and now he's dead. And they were sitting and complaining about all that, and in the midst of that, Jesus himself came and walked with them. And he was like, hey guys, they didn't even recognize him. Didn't even recognize him. How many times have you been going through life, maybe looking for your next faith high or your next prophecy or your next revelation or feeling bad because you haven't manifested yet or feeling bad because you haven't got, he ain't even asked me to preach yet. He, he, I ain't even got my chance to do this yet. I, I haven't even manifest, I can't even manifest the healing over my cold and, or you're just feeling bad because of what you thought was going to happen didn't happen. And you never know the time when Jesus is right there with you. You don't even recognize him because you're caught up in the circumstances and situations that you're facing. Maybe I'm the only one. But on the road to Emmaus, the disciples were sitting there and they were talking about how bad things were. Jesus walks right up with them. Hey, guys, what's up, guys? Why, what's, what's wrong? Oh, you, you must not even be from around here. Don't you know what's happened here, how bad it is? And they started telling him how bad it was, the one that they thought was. Now he's dead. You don't even know what's going on around here. And instead of Jesus getting caught up in how bad they were feeling and things going on. What the Bible says is that he started revealing himself beginning in the book of Moses. Has anybody read the book of Moses? Where's that even at in the Bible? Remember, God hid Moses in the cleft of a rock and passed by him. <laughs> the Bible says that God let, let Moses see his hinder, hinder parts. <laughs> he showed, God showed Moses his hinder parts. And when God showed, because he couldn't look on God's face, but he could see his hinder parts. And, and when God showed Moses his hinder parts, I, I believe that God showed Moses all that he did in creation in the time before the foundations of the world. I believe that God gave Moses a glimpse of, that's where that seeking, not peeking comes in. Or peeking, <laughs> not peeking, yeah, Illinois. Seeking God, not peeking at God. A lot of times we peek at God, and, and when you're peeking at God, you catch a glimpse of his hinder parts, but you're always seeing what he's done. When you're seeking God, you can seek him face to face. And then you're not stuck in just what he's done. You embrace him in who he is, what he's doing. You get what I'm saying? You have anything to say? No, we're doing great. Can I be excused for a minute? No. <laughs> Please. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was something in that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the, the reason that that's so significant is because when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus with those disciples, they said this, they said, did our hearts not burn within us 
as he revealed himself in the scriptures. And see, the sad part about it is we, we look at the Old Testament scriptures so many times and we, we know that there's a... We, you can't just throw out the Old Testament scriptures. I mean, it's, it's, it's not... At that, you, can't, you can't do that. But so many times we look at the Old Testament scriptures and we want to learn from Moses and we want to learn from David and we want to be like Elijah and we want to do what Solomon did. How many wives did Solomon have? How in the world? How in the world could Jesus even talk about him being wise with that many lives? See, I can't. I'm from Kentucky, and all. I can't wrap my around that. Anyway, but the disciples said this. They said, "Did our hearts not burn within us as He was revealing Himself to us in the Scriptures, beginning at the Book of Moses?" This says that he began in the book of Genesis revealing a person, the person of Christ, not Abraham, not Isaac, not Jacob. In the story of Abraham, and the life of Abraham was pointing to the person of Christ. In the life of Isaac, the, the story of Isaac was pointing to the person of Christ. And, and Jesus started revealing himself to them in the story of Noah. It wasn't about an ark. It wasn't about the evil things in the man's heart. It wasn't about the floods. It was about the person of Christ who was the ark of salvation for all of humanity. See, Jesus started revealing himself in all the Old Testament stories. And without meaning to, sometimes we look at the Old Testament stories and we think, I got to learn what I got to do to make God happy. The purpose of the Old Testament stories is to point to the person of Christ. So that he can be seen. Yes, and what he did. That causes your heart to burn. When you see Christ revealed, that causes your heart to burn. When you see Christ, see, we, we don't, this doesn't mean much to us. But the moment of time where Christ is being revealed to you, that's what causes your heart to burn. See, when you get born again, the Bible says he takes out the old heart and puts a new heart within you. That new heart that's within you, you don't impress that new heart that's been placed within you because old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That new heart that's within you is not impressed in how good you can keep the law. Now, if you look at your watch, I go longer. Just know that. <laughs> it's an extra 10 minutes. Because I, I, honestly, I can, I can hold my, I don't have to tinkle. I can hold it. You're, keep going, man. You're doing good. Well, I need to think. <laughs> One of the aspects of the new heart that he's placed within us because we've been born again. You know, the Bible says that Christ Jesus is the mediator of a better right. covenant, mm -hmm. a new covenant. We said for so long, listen, an old covenant mentality cannot manifest a new covenant reality. You know the greatest, the zenith, if I say a zenith, what do you think of? A TV. Remember the zenith TV? That's all I think of. When I think of a zenith, I think of a TV. But the zenith represents the highest point of something. So the zenith of the old covenant was to crucify the Messiah when he comes. That was the highest point of the Old Covenant. And it had to happen that way. I'm not mad at him. It had to happen that way. The Messiah had to come and all of the Old Covenant, all of the law that made you guilty before God, made you guilty before God, made you guilty before God, shut everybody's mouth. The highest point of that was to see to it that the Messiah got crucified when he manifested here. But if you operate in an old covenant mentality, you're still waiting for that zenith to come and the highest expression of faithfulness from the old covenant mentality, the greatest expression of an old covenant reality is to crucify the Messiah when he comes. The Messiah had to be crucified. 
All these things must come to pass so righteousness can be fulfilled. See, the law is righteous in and of itself. But the greatest manifestation of the law don't have the power to make you righteous. But the law had the power to see to it that the Messiah got crucified. Well, I see, that's a blessing. Yeah? Um, anyway, the new heart that's on the inside of you, the only thing that causes that new heart to burn is not by you not sinning. That, doesn't, that does not impress that new heart. Well, I can just quit sinning enough. God will be pleased with me. Yeah, according to the old covenant mentality, you're right. But what if there's a new covenant reality that supersedes whether or not you sin? As a matter of fact, there's a new covenant reality that says in Christ the law is fulfilled. Sin ain't got nothing to do with it. Sin's one of these things you're looking back on in some hinder parts, conjured up, trying to get it involved in the new place where you're walking now. No, it's just something that comes along with me. I know, bless your darling heart. It's where we've been stuck for so long, but the thing that causes the new heart to burn, to be on fire, is the revealing of the person of Christ. Seeing Christ revealed in the scriptures from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, beyond the book, not just according to the oldness of the letter, but according to the newness of the spirit of life. And without meaning to, that's not what we've got in the habit of doing. Because we read the Old Testament, thou shalt not kill. I ain't killing nobody. Thou shalt not steal. I ain't stole nothing. I don't even steal a piece of toilet paper at the church. We get these convictions on doing right and not doing wrong. And we actually take the Old Testament and we apply the truths out of the Old Testament and we operate in what's called moral deism. It ends up being idolatry. Yeah. You don't even think about it because I'm just doing what I, I quit sinning. Listen, I, I'm not impressed once I get too old and fat to sin. Uh, let me says to say it this way. When I get too old now to shake to sin. I'm just telling you, I, I'm 51 years old. I don't, I, I'm not even as capable of sinning like I was when I was in my 20s. I don't, I mean, I, I'm not, if, if I were to go on a sin rampage right now, it would be different today than it was when I was 20. It would be quite limited, yes. My sin rampage wouldn't look the same as it did when I was in my 20s. Nope. And, and listen, so many times we think the goal of the Christian life or the relationship with, with God or, 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 or accepting Jesus our Lord and Savior is to make us stop sinning. The, stopping sinning is not that impressive because any of us, all of us can get too old and fat to sin. Easy. Uh, I'm trying not to look at anybody. <laughs> all of us. <laughs> all of us can do that but yet we've spent a majority of our Christian life trying to fight the sin trying to fight the sin have you ever have you ever found your place in that uh, maybe that uh, who, who, who in here is honest alright do you have um, like a little pet sin okay alright have you ever do you just get up and I want to cuss today like I ain't never cussed before you don't do that, do you? Do you ever get up and say, I ain't cussing today? I ain't cussing today. You stub your toe, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever said, I mean, have you ever thought, I'm just not going to cuss, I'm not going to cuss, I'm not going to cuss, and then you find yourself cussing? <laughs> Maybe, I'll never cuss again, I'll never cuss again, I'll never cuss again, and then, you know. See, you're not the only one, and I appreciate your honesty. That's what happens with sin. And that sin that you swear that you'll never do again, that you're not going to do, you're not going to do, you're not going to do, just like Paul, what's your name? Tony. And just like Tony, that thing you don't want to do, blankety blanket, I'm doing it anyway. That's my cousin. No, his cousin I, is poopy. <laughs> I could hold a mic for you. Do you guys want to hear an example of the cousin? Let me ask you something. How comfortable would you be cussing here in church? Uh, do you cuss around these people? Is this your first time here? Is it really? I'm sorry. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> hey, listen, whatever happens, they don't hold it against them, okay? I'm from Kentucky. I'm a hillbilly. I ain't got nothing to do with these people. They don't even know who I am. <laughs> Oh, Lord have mercy. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go restroom. I've got time out. <laughs> no, Tony said to make you suffer. Get back up here. <laughs> no, but I mean, that, that's exactly my point. The very thing that you say you're not going to do. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. You find yourself doing it. And, and, and Tony's no different than Paul. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But yet he said, the very thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That's poopy. <laughs> <laughs> And Paul said, the very thing I want to do, I find myself not being able to do. And the very thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Why? Poopier. Because, because when, you're, when, you're focused, when you're focused on fighting that sin, it will always win. Listen, none of us in and of ourselves have power that's greater than sin. You can try to resist the sin. You can try to fight the sin. You can try to flee the sin. But if sin is what you're focused on, whatever you're focused on gets mad. That's right. That's right. And the more you focus on that sin, the more opportunity sin has to enter in. None of us want to just give over to sin. Christ Jesus came so that he could take away the dominion of sin. But in the body of Christ, we want to hold on to the sin by thinking on it, focusing on it, preaching on it, chasing it, fighting it. Is there some here? Is there some there? You got some? You got some? I want that sin. You missed a spot. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't misunderstand me, but without meaning to, we get so sin-focused that we fail to embrace what it is that God sent to overcome. You know what the Bible says? Let me see. I'm, a, I'm an old Baptist, aren't we? Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Okay. What, what kind, what, was it at a church? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Is it really a second time here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just knew this guy was a pillar in the church. Been here. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I, I feel like we got a little. We got some hope. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Where was I? Tony, what was I saying? Don't forget to sin. Yeah. We've chased some sins. <laughs> I'm a good Baptist boy. I do. I ate some I ate some really good fried chicken at a pizza joint yesterday. It was good. It was good. I was thinking, what's up with that? Anyway. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And see, that song that I was really talking about it wasn't praise you the Lord, hallelujah. It was Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so little ones to him below they are weak for he is strong Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. See, when you're a kid and you sing that, it has meaning. Sometimes we get so entrenched in the battle against sin that we forget the very essence of that song. Do you know that that really wasn't a children's song? Do you know it's really a hymn? Do you know it's really, I mean, in the big grown-up hymn book, it was a hymn, Jesus Loves Me. But yet, I've never been to a church where we've sung the hymn. Only the kids sing that song. The grown-ups quit singing it. Why? Because they get so busy about being spiritual and fighting sin that they lose touch with the reality and the truth. Jesus loves me this I know because they get so distracted by trying to prove that they love Jesus now what? well it wasn't until I understood that God loved me 
No. It changes everything. When you take your focus off how much you love him and understand how much he loves you, then the love just flows. When, when we got, when we, I was so thankful when I got, are you guys still here? You got about five minutes. <laughs> That's our introduction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us all a restroom break. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give us all a restroom break here in just a minute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, when we first got set free from the drugs and alcohol, I was so thankful. I'm talking about I was so thankful that I didn't have to find the buzz. I didn't have to chase the high. I was so thankful that I would have done anything for God. I'm talking about if, if, uh, if someone would have come to my house and said, God wants you to go to New Zealand, I'd have done it because I, was, I hadn't lived a life without having to have drugs. And so I was just so thankful. Um, right after we did that, Libby said, well, God wants me to give the stealth away. Well, I was thinking, give the stealth away? That ain't, that ain't God. You don't give the stealth away. I mean, one of the reasons I married her was that stealth. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, you give the stealth away, I'm going with it just how I felt and it didn't happen <laughs> I was so thankful to be set free from the drugs and alcohol I would have done practically anything for God and I was so thankful I wanted to prove to God that I was thankful I wanted to prove to God how much I loved him and then we, we would start going to church and I'd hear people say if you just loved God more you wouldn't sin so much if you just loved God more, you'd be at church more often. If you loved God more, you'd be nice to your brother and sister. If you loved God more, you'd read your Bible. And see, that's what I bought into. So up until the time we got hit by the train, what Libby and I were doing is we were practicing how to show God how much we loved him. We wanted our pastors to see how much we loved him. We wanted, we wanted our brothers and sisters to see how much we loved God. We wanted God to know how much we loved him. And we were so, I mean, with a good heart. I wasn't trying to bend God's heart and, and make him do something. I wanted him to know that I loved him, but we were so focused on our love for God. We, we were heck bent and determined. I'll give you guys a second on that one. <laughs> That's not quite how I would we have said it. We were bitten determined. <laughs> Those who are trying to overcome cussing, <laughs> being sensitive to that. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, that's exactly, that's the way that we got into our relationship with God was taking the scriptures and we would read those scriptures and whatever the scripture said, we tried to do it because in us doing what the scripture said, to us that proved that we loved God. And we were so wanting to prove that we loved God. And the sad thing about it is that on Sunday morning, it was a whole lot easier to love God because we was around the pastor, oh, how you doing? They're blessed and highly favored. You know, we learned the things to say real quick. I learned who to cuss not in front of and who not to cuss in front of. You get what I'm saying? Maybe I was the only one. <laughs> but I mean, that's what we've learned in church because what's happened is we've all bought into a presentation of the gospel of Christ that he loved you. Now you have to prove that you love him. But see, love doesn't seek its own. Listen, one of the things about us is we, we, we want a reciprocal if I tell you I love you, Pastor Bob, automatically, what do you want to say to me? I love you, bro. Yeah, I do love you. I love you too. You love me too, don't you? Yes. See, if he doesn't say it, I start feeling funny. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, I just made, my, I put my heart on a line out here. I let you know that I love you and you don't even give me no love back. <laughs> but that's, that's my point. So many times what we do without meaning to is we give actions of love, but we're looking for something back. We're looking for a reciprocal, and we're convinced that that's the way God is. <coughs> we try to put that aspect of humanity upon God. The reality of it is, is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And while you were yet lost and dead in your sin, he reconciled you into himself through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, God doesn't wait for and demand a response out of us. That He's not human like that. 
but yet we believe he is. Well, he's got to have my obedience. He's got to have my belief. He's got to have my agreement. He's got to have my something. Quit focusing on you. Listen, I was talking the, the other day in the, in the class. Here's the reality of it. When you're focused on you and your love, on Sunday morning, it's real high. But Sunday afternoon, while you're waiting for the buffet, it starts diminishing a little. Sunday afternoon, about 12, 15, when the preacher's still preaching, see, that love, that love walk starts diminishing just a little bit. Now, it don't, it don't spike to the bottom, but I, I see it. I see it. I, I'm seeing it. I'm, I'm, I, I, I got a detector. So, so that love walk all of a sudden is diminishing just a little bit because, well, well Pastor Bob would have done had us out of here. Yeah. Is that true? Not yet. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? How, how about, how about uh, um, then you, you go to work on Monday? Man, what a good message yesterday. Yeah, it was on point and it really helped me out. I can really see. And then all of a sudden some yahoo cuts you off right when you're trying to get on the or better than that, some big old, one of them big old corn machines. They got big old corn machines up here. They'll get right up in front of you. <laughs> act like you, act like where you're going doesn't have a bit and ain't important <laughs> whatsoever. You're just like, <laughs> like, brother, cut your corn some other time. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? All of a sudden, I'm ready to pass on a double yellow line because the, 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 my love walk is done diminishing, and now this yahoo's this holding me up. Ain't nobody looking. You got these big long roads out here. They ought to have, they ought to have dotted yellow lines everywhere. Well, you want me to wait on a dotted yellow line? Are you kidding me? This is a straight stretch. Man, in Kentucky, you've got these small areas. When they're straight stretch, you pass. I don't care if there's a double dotted line or not. <laughs> this is the only straight stretch. the only place I can get around them. Up here, you got these miles, and they got a big, big, fat double yellow line. I could lay down in between them yellow lines up here. What I'm thinking, what is up with that? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. At different times, our love walk is higher and stronger, and then at other times, it's a little bit lower. And then sometimes it's a little bit higher, you know, when you're feeling real spiritual and real wordy-like, and then all of a sudden... You start feeling a little bit more carnal. You get a little bit frustrated, a little bit of disappointment. Well, I thought it was going to be like this. I thought it was going to be like that. And before you know it, your love walk is a little bit lower. And if you start focusing, if you keep focusing on your love walk and your love for God, that sometimes is real high and then other times is real low. Sometimes it's real high and sometimes it's real low. It's like a roller coaster. And what ends up happening, if you do that roller coaster long enough, it causes you to... exactly right so see the sad part about it is that the majority of us have learned a relationship with God trying to prove our love to God it's all performance based yes and it's caused us to operate like bipolar Christians that's the perfect word I didn't know if I could say that here or not <laughs> see there's people bipolar people in my family so I grew up around bipolar and I learned the best way for me to handle the bipolar people is to give in to ADHD. <laughs> I just start being ADHD and they're, they're bipolar. They didn't know what to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm, that's, how, that's how we did in my family. We didn't have medication. I just gave in to the ADHD. The bipolar was up here and then trying to kill us here. And my ADHD would kick in. I'd be out of the way. I let, you know, plates flying and things happening and cussing. and I'm, Didn't phase me. I'm like the gingerbread man. Oh, that wasn't bipolar for me. <laughs> but that, that's exactly what happens. And we, without meaning to, we take our kids and we try to force them to focus on their love walk for God. We do it with, the, with look, son, daughter, if you loved me enough, you'd behave. You'd do this. You'd go to school. You wouldn't do this. We try to teach our kids to do the same thing because we're convinced that's the way God wants to father us. But what if God has a different plan? Check this out. I've said this so many times. An old covenant mentality cannot manifest a new covenant reality. You know the major difference between an old covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant? If I were to ask you, um, what represents the old covenant to you? Don't be scared. Sacrifices. 
sacrifices. That's good. Give me another answer. What? The law. And not just any law. What, like the, the Keystone Cop? No, the Ten Commandments. The ones that were written and engraven in stones. That is representative of the Old Covenant. That was a perfect answer. And see, the thing of it is, is that have you ever really looked at the Ten Commandments? Where are they at? Man, I was preaching at a, I was preaching at a, a holiness. I was. <laughs> they hid the law in their hearts. And it's in this box. <laughs> For real? You ain't got them nowhere? Can you guys name them? Not you. It took us, it took us eight months to be able to say the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm just telling you straight up. We started, we said about three. We keep all ten. Come on, you guys are taking a long time here. Okay, no other gods before me. What? Not kill. Okay. Honor your mother and father. And uh, don't take his name in vain. Don't cut it. Yeah. Don't swear. <laughs> Where would you find these people? <laughs> My granny wouldn't swear. She'd say, I swanny. <laughs> That's what she used. I swanny. Do not commit adultery. Don't lie. It took us a while to get to that one. I don't know. They were throwing extras at me, so I, I forgot which I forgot which hand I was counting on. <laughs> Is that one of the Ten Commandments? Okay. Honor. Okay, we're going to start over. For, <laughs> well, sometimes it's a little bit of a struggle, isn't it? But have you ever looked at the first word in each one of the commandments? I mean, us King James people. Thou. What's thou mean? You. Means you. Have you ever noticed that the first word in each one of the Ten Commandments is you? See, I'm not anti-law. I'm not anti-law. The law in and of itself is spiritual, perfect. But the law was not meant for a righteous man because the law forces you to focus on you. And as long as you're focused on you, do you know who you're not focused on? Do I, do I, do I need to say it? As long as you're focused on you, do you know who you're not focused on? See, without meaning to, we focus so much on the law, but when you, when you focus on the law, the law forces you to focus on you to shut your mouth and to prove to you that we all fall short of the glory of God. That is the function of the law. That's why the Bible says the law is great if it's used lawfully, but it's not meant to be used against a righteous man. Well, when you get born again, he became sin to make you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You just so happen to be born again into a place of righteousness, but yet we still hold on to the law. And then every time we do it, what's the first word of each one of the Ten Commandments? It makes you focus on you. People don't like to hear stuff like this, but it's the truth of it. What Christ Jesus came to do, though, is to take the focus off of you and let you get the focus upon him. You know, when, when Peter was in the boat and Christ was walking on the water, he said, I think I see Christ out there. His eyes set upon him. He said, Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come. Jesus said, yeah, it's me. Come on. Peter steps over that and Peter walked on the water. And as long as Peter kept his eyes upon Christ, he walked upon that water. But once his eyes got off Christ, he began to sink. Listen, the only thing I'm saying is this. 
the old covenant mentality cannot manifest the new covenant reality because the old covenant reality keeps your eyes in the wrong direction, in the wrong place. I'm not against the law, but the purpose of the law, the purpose of the old covenant was not to get you saved. It didn't have the power to cleanse you. It didn't have the power to do that. You can keep looking at it and say, I'm not killing. I'm not stealing. I ain't putting no other gods before you. You know, but the whole time you're doing that, the focus, your focus is on you. The reality of it is, is that anyone or anything that we put our focus on other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so he can put, point us to the glory of the Father, it becomes idolatry. Even how good you don't kill can be idolatry to you. And it stands in the way of your heart burning, catching the revelation of Jesus. If you think you're good enough, you don't need Jesus revealed when you think you're good enough. If, if Tony really believed that he could not cuss in his own strength and power, he doesn't even need to look to God to find the power not to. If you are good enough at keeping the law, you don't feel like you have a problem with sin. You feel like your brother does. Your sister does. I don't. I'm so good at not sinning. It's only Bob... Bob Martin's got the problem with sin. Won't even call him pastor. Now he's Bob because you're so focused on how much you don't sin. Listen, I started all this off saying if you're sin focused, it knocks you off the end game. If you're trying to fight sin, do you know what? <laughs> Let me just throw this at you. God created the heavens and the earth. Remember, the earth was without form. Darkness and, and the spirit was, how was it? How does it say it? The spirit covered the waters. You guys know what I'm talking about? This is part of the hinder part of God. <laughs> when God created the earth and brought forth it, it was without form and void, but once he put form and void to it, do you remember what happened? He went to this place called Eden. Do you know what the word for Eden is? I'm coming off. Wait a minute. I'm going to tell you the wrong thing. Now, you guys give me just a minute here and we'll get out of here. I have to congratulate you on something. On who? You. For what? You literally hit every chapter. <laughs> That you said to me. That did it, did it? The last one, I was thinking he's missed Genesis. He didn't hit Genesis yet. Bam, you got it. I'm impressed. I'm telling you, I am impressed. Y'all was wondering what I was doing up there, what? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to the scriptures and he was talking about it. He hit every one of these. Oh my gosh. And that wasn't even the message. Listen, I had this really great message about the spirit, soul, and body. The very God of peace, that's why we started off that way, who sanctifies you holy, spirit, soul, and body. That was my message. I don't know what happened. But God's faithful. No, no, here, we'll, we'll finish this out. The Garden of Eden means paradise, pleasure, paradise, okay? And do you remember how what happened in the Garden of Eden? Remember God formed somebody on the dust of the ground? Who was it? Don't be scared. It was Adam. Remember he formed Adam out of the dust of the ground and then breathed life into Adam and caused him to be a living soul? And, and then he, he said Adam's lonely. Caused Adam to fall asleep and then what happened? He took him to the rib and, and created Eve. Right out of the very side of Adam, created him Eve. And remember, God had Adam and Eve and they were in the Garden of Eden do you know that there was no sin? They were placed in the middle of paradise. They were completely sinless. Do you know that Adam and Eve had never sinned when they were in that garden of Eden together? They were completely sinless with no sin knowledge, no sin action, no sin influence. Instead, they were placed in paradise without even a concept of sin, but yet still, 
And sin's not the, sin's the product of something. But it's not supposed to be the object of what we're fighting. Do you know what happened in the Garden of Eden? The serpent came in through his subtlety. And he used the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life to influence Adam and Eve to a point to where they took an action that opened up a door for sin to come in. There's nothing new under the sun, guys. God's wanting to bring forth an empowering revelation of Jesus Christ that strengthens you in the midst of your everyday moments of life to where you're empowered by God to resist the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life so that you don't have to keep bowing your heart bowing your knee, bowing your life down to the results of what comes in, which is sin. You can fight the sin all you want to, and even if you squash the sin out, you still fall prey to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The revealing of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, the revelation of Jesus Christ in your heart. The Bible says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. The good news of Jesus Christ being revealed to you empowers you unto salvation one moment at a time, one thought at a time, one feeling at a time. And strengthens you to be able to resist the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And in that time, you'll find yourself at a time when you feel like cussing. Oh, shucks. I remember the first time it happened to me. I was a cusser. I was a cusser. I like Lydia. I cuss my cuss words. And that day, God said, "I'm a God that does things from the inside out." I was so excited, and I thought, "Awesome! I don't have to fix everything. He's taking care of things." And then without meaning to, I quit cussing. I, I go home to my, I go home to somebody else's wife because I was living with somebody else's wife at the time. And uh, I go home and I sit down and we're eating dinner. And, just talking about what's going on and I said something like I'm oh, too I don't know I, I, I was thinking I don't feel very tough <laughs> I don't give a darn you know I mean I was using some saying it because we're but it's just where I was um, and something happened in my heart when there was a revealing of the gospel of Christ in my heart. It empowered me not to just give over to the sin that so easily beset me. Listen, the revealing of Jesus Christ in the scriptures. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible or how much you read the Bible, but I encourage you, use your faith. Set yourself on purpose when you read the Bible. I want to see the revealing of Jesus Christ in these scriptures, or I don't even want to read them. Listen, the Old Testament scriptures are not just given to tell you how to live your life. The Old Testament scriptures, the New Testament scriptures are all given to do the revealing of how God so loved the world, which he sent his son to take away the sin. When you see the revealing of whom God hath sent, that causes you to, the Bible says that causes you to work the works of God. Because it causes something to happen on the inside of here. And then all of a sudden you're doing it from in here. Instead of the focus being out here on you and what you can do and what you can't do, the focus gets upon him. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. I cover all the scriptures. Every one of them. I didn't mean to. I really was going to do the I didn't see how you were going to do that. Huh? I didn't see how you were going to do that. <laughs> I didn't either. Hey, uh. I just think that the time that we're living in, guys, it's not enough for us to just go through religious activities. It's not enough for us to settle for what we felt like or what we thought before. The adversary is always trying to steal your now. He doesn't care if he gets you to look in the back in the past or if he gets you to look somewhere ahead. Now faith is the 
the substance of things hoped for. Christ Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection purchased the back door now so that we can accomplish his will on earth now as it is in heaven. You get what I'm saying? So just so just because there's a few little adjustments that we need to make, it's important for you. Have, have you guys ever recognized that the first word in all the Ten Commandments was you? It's so important to take that little shift, just a little adjustment, so that you're not always focused on you. Does that make sense? I'm proud of you for sticking through. And I apologize that you had to bear with me. good. Amen. Father, we just come before you right now in the name of Jesus and we thank you for your faithfulness. Father, we thank you that you're always faithful to love us, to lead us, to guide us. <laughs> and Father, I'm just thankful that you don't hold you don't hold our humanity against us, but instead you've made a way to be able to sanctify us completely. Spirit, soul and body and you're reaching into our hearts and our souls and our lives even at this moment of time and you're the sanctifier you are sanctifying us Father God through your word and through prayer and Father God just to see your will done on this earth as it is in heaven from this day forward Father we're not just going through the motions we're not just going through the motions. We're not just doing spiritual calisthenics, but instead, Father God, where the rubber meets the road, there's a revealing of Jesus Christ that keeps our hearts burning, burning, burning with that desire to see Christ manifest in our now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.